Welcome everyone. Thanks so much for coming out tonight. Um, this is our 2016 Lieutenant Governor debate. And uh, for those who may not know us, um, BT Digger is a statewide nonprofit investigative news site. And events like this are part of our attempt to encourage the public discourse on matters of politics and public policy. So thank you so much for coming out tonight. And thanks to everyone who's watching on our live stream. I'm on the BT Digger website, and thanks to Orca Media, which is producing the live stream tonight. Um, and uh, thank you to the candidates, David Zuckerman and Randy Brock, for taking time out of your very busy campaign schedule to join us tonight. And I'm going to pass this off to Mark Johnson. Thank you very much, Ann. Um, I want to thank also the candidates for joining us tonight. Let me just give you a little background here on what we're going to do with the format. Uh, the candidates are going to be given 90 seconds to answer a question. Uh, Teresa Murray Klassen, who is with uh, btdigger.org, is going to be uh, our timer tonight. She is going to signal our candidates when they have 30 seconds left and also when their entire 90 seconds are up. Uh, we, uh, depending on how we do a time here, our plan is to go an hour. Uh, and we may get to some of your questions out here in the audience as well, depending on how quickly uh, we are going. We're going to begin tonight. My first question, I want to ask the candidates to reflect a little bit. We hear a lot in this campaign uh, talk about the economic struggles that uh, many Vermonters are having, particularly out in the rural communities. And I'd like the candidates to reflect and look backward here and give us a sense of why you think, in particular in rural communities, so many Vermonters are facing a challenge. And we uh, begin with Senator David Zuckerman. Well, thank you, Mark. Can you hear me? Okay. Thank you, Mark. Uh, well, looking back at this, I think it's actually an issue that's important to reflect on in context. There's actually rural struggles in about 35 or 40 states across the country. So I don't think it's, think it's a unique issue to Vermont. I think it's partly a cultural shift as we get exposed to the world through our smartphones and all the various media throughout the world. A lot of folks want to go towards urban areas. Uh, at the same time, we also really haven't invested in our rural areas the way that we do invest in some of our more urban centers. We have high-speed internet where we have uh, urban or town centers and not really out into some of the rural areas. I'm very pleased as a farmer to be a part of the rural economy. Uh, and in Vermont, I think we're actually doing better than many of the other states that are struggling. But we still have more to do. Uh, I'd like to see us do more toward building broadband and better cell service out to our rural areas so that so many of our smart entrepreneurs can start businesses in those rural areas and keep them there rather than having to go to the, the denser Chittenden County or some of the other spots. Uh, so I think it's partly a national cultural shift. I think in Vermont we're doing a better job, uh, but we need to do more. And uh, to me, investing in uh, both job training and both uh, opportunities in the state to help small businesses that have two or three employees to grow to being five and 15 employee businesses in our rural areas is probably one of the best things we can do for our economy because growing small businesses to medium businesses is really where the backbone of our economy and the backbone of our community are tied together rather than trying to draw some large business to a rural area uh, which would really disrupt some of the character as well. Randy Mark. Vermont is a hard place to do business. Virtually every uh, study that's been done, every report that's been done uh, that describes how what Vermont's business climate is compared to the rest of the country puts us at very near the bottom in terms of business friendliness and business competitiveness. And that uh, is something that affects both our larger communities and it affect, affects especially uh, our smaller communities. Uh, People come to me more than anything else and say how expensive it is to live in Vermont, how difficult it is to make a living in Vermont, uh, how Vermont has become increasingly unaffordable. Addressing affordability across the board is a high priority for me. I think it should be a high priority for our state because that's one of the things that creates some of the economic lack of competitiveness that we have. Uh, our structures and the way we do things uh, for a state of 625,000, we do things uh, in, in many ways that make the costs of doing business here very, very high. I started a small business here in Vermont oh, many, many years ago and grew that business from a one-person operation to a company that operated in multiple states. 
I don't know if I can do that again when I look at uh, the cost structure, the tax structure, uh, the regulatory structure that we have in here in Vermont today would make that increasingly difficult. I think one of the things that we must look at more than anything else is how to make Vermont affordable, how to reduce the high cost and how to reduce the burden of government on our citizens and particularly on our businesses. I think it's very important that we create an environment that says to Vermont that Vermont is in fact open to business and it says it both to Vermonters, it says to those who are not in business, it says it to people who are in existing businesses today that we do want business, we do want business expansion. I agree that high-speed internet uh, is an absolute essential, and indeed that was something uh, that with $200 million in federal funds coming from uh, the American Recovery Act after the beginning of the Great Recession, uh, we were promised that that's what we were going to have, but we clearly still don't have it. And that's one of the things that I would strongly encourage us to do as Lieutenant Governor, is to use the kind of probity that I've been noted for in the past to find out why we didn't get what was promised, what wasn't delivered, what contractors didn't give us what they said they were going to. Let me, let me pick up on this broadband question because I was going to ask David this, but let me give you a crack at it first. I was asking about rural poverty. What difference is it going to make to bring broadband out to rural communities when people are struggling with basic needs? Well, people are struggling with basic needs, but there are entrepreneurs in the rural economy just as there are, uh, believe it or not, in, in Chittenden County. Uh, I went, for example, not too long ago to a, a small business in, in Putney, and he was located on a, a back road in the middle of nowhere in Putney, and he had a furniture business. He made beautiful handcrafted furniture, and I asked him, how did he sell his products? given how isolated he was. And the answer was, on the road that he was on, he had a high-speed internet. And as a result, the world were his customers, and he was able to run a thriving one-man business. We live in an era of technology today, with things like 3D printers in which you can produce a product of one. You don't need a factory the way you did uh, 30, 40, 50, or 100 years ago. The promise of technology is with us, and that's one of the things that can extend what we want to do into the rural community much more so than we could today. There are also a number of things that we can and ought to do with agriculture to make our agriculture products uh, more available, more usable, more uh, in keeping with the Vermont brand, and that's something that I'm going to be talking about a lot. Well, I'll start uh, by appreciating uh, my opponent's discussion about agriculture, because as part of the agricultural renaissance in Vermont over the last 15 years, We've actually seen tremendous job growth in that area. It's one of the fastest growing sectors, along with renewable energy. And that's partly happened because in Vermont, we've invested in agriculture with the working lands enterprise, with farm to school, with really reinvigorating our local agricultural economy. But rural people are struggling. There's no doubt about it. And that's why things like increasing the minimum wage are also important, so that people can earn enough to pay their basic wage, uh, pay their basic wage through life, whether it's uh, of their housing, their transportation, their food. These are the basic struggles people are facing. Now, one thing folks might not realize in Vermont is that in the last six years, those who earn more than $100,000 have seen their incomes go up by $3.7 billion over these last four or five years. Working people have not seen that piece of the pie. And that's because of economic policies, starting back with Reaganomics, but continuing through the Jim Douglas years, where we say, if you have money, you get to keep it, and those who are struggling at the bottom, we're not going to raise your wages the way they ought to be raised. I believe in raising minimum wage. I believe in increasing funding for affordable, perpetual affordable housing, and making it so that people can live and work in our rural areas. I believe in investing in uh, energy efficiency so that we actually reduce people's cost of living in rural areas. And it looks like time is up in the nod over there. Let's um, continue this, though. You, you've, uh, David, you get the first crack at this question. Uh, you've spoken also that you don't feel wealthy people are paying their fair share when it comes to property taxes. Tell us what you're talking about proposing, or are you talking about making the entire system based on income or something else? Well, a long time ago we talked about making it based on income, and one of the dangers of straight-up income tax-based is that you have increased volatility, and that's challenging when you're looking for stable funding for education. However, with 70% of Vermonters paying income-adjusted property taxes, folks are paying normally about 25 to 3% of their income in property taxes for schools. However, the wealthier third of Vermonters 
are actually paying a much lower percentage of their income towards their education system. And I think there's two issues around education. One is balancing and making the, the pay structure that we all put into the system fair and equitable, which would actually increase uh, based on income for wealthier Vermonters and decrease for average Vermonters by a few hundred dollars a year. But secondly, it's also looking at our cost side. And I've talked about it for a number of years in the Education Committee about how to bring our human services budget and our education budget closer together by bringing human services individuals into the schools to address many of the costs that are driving up education, classroom disruption, special education, other challenges that kids bring into the schools so that we can free our teachers up to be educators and inspiring people that they want to be. And we can use folks who are experienced in the social work world and human services world to address the human services needs. We right now are du duplicating those services, so we, we need to reduce those costs and have better services for our kids, as well as adjust tax system. So do you want to have the entire system based on, on income? Would that be the way I think it go? could be adjusted for everybody based on income. For some it would be up, for some it would be down, but what it is is uh, those who are at the lower end of the spectrum tend to get a rebate because their property tax, their property value versus their income is typically much higher. And so for those that say, let's scrap the system, they're talking about a huge tax increase for working Vermonters. What I'm talking about is making it income based for all Vermonters so that those that are currently paying 1% or a half percent, those that make a million or $2 million a year also pay two and a half percent. Okay, got it, thank you. Well, the issue of taxation based on income does certainly involve volatility because one of the things the Blue Ribbon Tax Commission study in 2010 indicated is that many of the people who are reported to be millionaires are millionaires for one year because of one-time events. That happens more than, than we know. We, we have a very heavily progressive tax system as it is in which those people who are at the top end of the scale do in fact pay the lion's share of the taxes. Uh, there's always a lot of talk about millionaires who escape the tax, uh, uh, to, who escape through tax loopholes and otherwise, but we have a relatively small number of people at that very high end, and one of the things about those people that we've seen is that they are highly mobile. Raising tax rates to the point of uh, them being even higher and more excessive than they appear to be now will do nothing more than drive people out of state, leaving higher tax burdens for those uh, who remain. Uh, I believe that we do need to balance and we have an effective means of balancing right now uh, in what we're doing in which indeed income sensitivity payments represent the single greatest expense in the entire education fund. Uh, I think it's perhaps overweighted in, in, in that respect and we will increase higher vol uh, volatility in our taxes uh, were we to alter it further. I think we do though have great opportunity to make changes on the basis of our spending. Uh, I think David's idea of combining uh, some means of uh, human services uh, with uh, education in the school system makes sense at first. But then if we remove from teachers some of the things that they're doing right now and expect other people to do those same things, those are additional people. We will continue to have the lowest student-teacher ratio in the country, and then we will have higher human services costs as a result in addition. I'm very concerned about the structure of what it is he proposes because it won't lower costs, it will further increase them in an education system that is already among the highest cost systems per capita in the entire United States. You want to follow address that a little bit? Um, let's be clear, what I was talking about is we have people on the education side doing these services and on human services doing these services and by bringing them together you can actually reduce the staff doing that. So let's be clear uh, with how my opponent has portrayed what I'm talking about versus the reality of what I'm talking about. Also, with respect to wealthy people, net migrations, we've raised taxes on wealthy individuals, and some people leave and some people come. The statistics bear that out time and time again. And yes, it's true, some people have one-time large earnings, but on average, one year one has that, and another year a different person has that. But on average, uh, that has been about the same over the last many years. And so the numbers do add up, it's very clear. And again, let's remember, when my opponent talks about the expense of property tax rebates as something that's a bad thing, that is what is actually helping keep many people in their homes by lowering their property taxes. Otherwise, we would be a much, much more aggressive system and many, many more Vermonters would have a very difficult time staying in their home, far more difficult than they do today. Right. 
the idea of the income sensitivity payment when it was originally created was to allow the poor widow who lived in a home on the lake whose, whose value, whose taxes had increased because through no fault uh, of her own, her prices, her, uh, prices of the land around her had increased and to protect that person from harm has now evolved into what essentially is a middle class tax entitlement. Uh, it reflects the fact that our taxing system hasn't really kept pace with modernity. Uh, it points again to the real need to do comprehensive tax reform across the board. It takes a look at all of our major taxes, being our income tax, our sales tax, and our property tax in a holistic way. Uh, what we have right now is a patchwork system that has been put in, in fact, uh, piecemeal. Now, we talk about the ins and outs uh, of taxes, of people who have high taxes one year, low taxes another year, and that certainly, in fact, happens. It happens quite regularly. But at the same time, there's a mathematical flaw that fails to be taken into account so often when we look at that. And that is the practice in which a person has a high income. For example, they sell a business, is, is the classic example, in one year. They may have made $100,000 in year one, which is a relatively high income in Vermont. But they know that they're going to sell that business for $2 million in year two. So what they do in year one is they change their domicile from Vermont to Florida or another state that doesn't have an income tax liability in year one, so if they sell their business in year two, the income that they get, that high rate of income, appears to go to the other state. It doesn't appear in the data at all when we compare. But what happens in reverse is the person who's moving to Vermont, so often a retiree, has no business to sell, has no major income. It appears to be a wash on the surface in each year, but in point of fact, we have a net loss. And it happens over and over again. Let's talk taxes. There's a proposal that's been floating out there now for years to expand the sales tax to services, while at the same time lowering the rate. Support the idea? The theory of it, I think, is great, because we are moving to a service economy. The practice of it, though, alarms me, and the practice of it is what concerns me uh, at the present time. You know, you've heard that phrase that when the legislature is in session, no person is safe. <laughs> and that's very, very true, because what that means is that no legislature can bind a future legislature as far as its actions are concerned. And so the fear is that if we drop the sales tax rate, or the sales tax rate, because we encompass services as well, uh, I think the Blue Ribbon Tax Commission said that we could get it as low as 2% if we taxed everything. Not that that's a very likely thing, given the number of lobbyists that inherit the statehouse. But if we were to lower it, let's say to 2% or 3%, the next legislature to come in, if they're matching very much like the legislatures that we have, will say things like, we need to have just a little bit more money, maybe to put some social workers in the schools. So we're going to raise it, oh, perhaps a quarter of a percent or a half a percent. Well, that'll go on year after year, and pretty soon, before you know it, we're going to be at a 6% tax rate for goods and services. And that's why I think unless we have a means to prevent that from happening, we shouldn't do it. Well, I do think, in theory, it's a good idea. It certainly wouldn't go down to 2%, because there are certain basic need services that I think we would exempt from this, not because of lobbyist pressure, but because it would be the right thing to do for working class, ordinary Vermonters. And frankly, the last time the sales tax was increased, it was under a Republican governor. So I don't think it was actually the interest of the legislature that made it happen. It was the tax that would affect working people the most and wealthy people the least. And that's what you get when you've got someone who looks out for wealthy interests. And for me, looking out to lower the sales tax, which is incredibly regressive for ordinary Vermonters, uh, and broadening it out to some of the services that wealthy people use much more so than ordinary working Vermonters, uh, I think is the right way to go. It has to be done judiciously, it has to be done fairly, and it has to be done with an eye that we all look out for the overall tax burden. My opponent earlier said we have the most progressive taxes in the country because wealthy people pay a lot. Progressivity is not whether wealthy people pay a lot or not. It's about how much do you pay in overall taxes as a percentage of your income. And even though we have one of the most progressive in the country, wealthy people still pay a lower percentage of their income into our overall civic government than ordinary working class Vermonters. Even with income tax adjustments for property taxes, uh, but because of sales taxes, gas taxes, and all the other fees that we have in government, working Vermonters pay more into the system as a percentage of their income than the wealthy, who again have seen 3.7 
billion dollars in economic growth in their in their pocketbooks in the last five years. If that's you, good on you. But for a lot of Vermonters who have been struggling for the last five years and haven't seen an increase, that's because our policies push money towards the wealthy. And frankly, I think it's time to look out for ordinary people. I'll take another minute on this. Well, I'm not sure how our policies push uh, so much money into the pockets of the wealthy when we have policies such as some of our renewable energy policies that provide uh, great incentives of uh, uh, proposed by and supported by uh, folks such as uh, uh, Senator Zuckerman that essentially increase the taxes on the poor of the middle class by providing huge subsidies to renewable energy providers uh, who uh, in turn then sell their wrecks out of state uh, to enrich people uh, elsewhere uh, through these credits which are really licenses to pollute while receiving huge subsidies and <coughs> Vermonters, the poor and the middle class, who pay the same rate per kilowatt hour as do these wealthy uh, uh, entrepreneurs uh, suffer. And they also typically pay a much larger percentage of their overall income, 24% compared to 7%. So we have policies that uh, do impoverish people, and we don't seem to be paying an awful lot of attention to those policies as well. We still have, among the highest tax rates uh, in the United States, marginal rates for wealthy people based on what they earn, and that's a fact. You got another chance if you want? Or not? Well, I'll just briefly say with respect to renewable energy, you know, we have seen over the last, I, I was on the Burlington Electric Commission almost 20 years ago, and so I understand the energy system pretty well. And back then, our presidential rates were the highest or second highest in New England, and now they're the second lowest in New England, in part because of our overall energy policy in Vermont. Both rates are lower, and we've been working to lower individuals' bills with energy efficiency measures, trying to reduce folks' heating costs, their energy use, from light bulb exchanges to businesses, changing out different kinds of compressors. We have been making those investments. That's good not only for ordinary Vermonters' pocketbooks, but it's also good for the economy of the state. As businesses end up with lower bills because we retrofit their business energy use, they have lower costs and they can be more competitive. There's no doubt that the cost of living is higher in New England. That's a reality. We have not had federal subsidies like water in the South and all the coal work, the cheap coal out West. When we look at climate change, I think it's incredibly important that we move uh, and support renewable energy, preferably smaller scale on people's roofs and in their backyards. But ultimately, we need to change our energy economy. We've been doing it in a positive way for Vermonters, and I'm proud of that. Let's talk about wind energy. Um, you're going to have the first opportunity on this question. How would you resolve the conflict between a community that doesn't want wind and a company that wants to bring it? Well, ultimately, I think when you're looking at wind energy or any energy, uh, it is a discussion around the public good and that we should be uh, bearing our burden, sadly, just like everywhere else in the world, that has energy production. This is a reality, we've exported it for most of our lives, and it, it's hard, there's no doubt that it's hard. But ultimately, we uh, have to be responsible for our energy consumption. And you know, it's something where I think we should expand the public service board and have more voices on the board to make sure that the broad, different public interests are incorporated beyond the size of the board. I'm not exactly sure how to do that yet, but I'd like to look further into that. And I also think we need to make sure folks who are adversely impacted do get compensated in some way, whether it's helping them uh, mitigate the effects, if that's possible, it may not always be possible, or helping them move, which is not easy. That's not what we want to do. We don't want to displace folks. But when I think about folks out west who are being displaced, folks whose mountaintops have been removed in, in, Virginia, in the uh, West Virginia and throughout the country, people are displaced by energy production in way larger scale than we are here in Vermont. What we need to do is reduce our energy footprint first and foremost, so we have to displace as few people or disrupt as few people's lives. Uh, but we have to take responsibility for our energy. So it's fair to say you're a supporter of big win. Yes, I, I am a supporter of, uh, of a range of energy, including big wind. From an efficiency perspective, I know some will dispute this, but some of these, uh, you know, three, four turbine systems produce <coughs> energy for 10,000 homes. That is very effective. Does it solve our problems? No, it is intermittent. I recognize that. Okay. But I do support it where it works from an engineering and economic perspective. Right. I don't know, I may be crazy, but somehow I don't think it's a great idea to build rich top wind towers blowing off the tops of our mountains and damaging wildlife habitat 
produce power that power companies don't want and that we don't necessarily need. Our problem with energy in Vermont doesn't come from the electricity uh, that flows into our homes. It comes largely through transportation, which is very different. Now, I understand the, the idea that, well, we're going to get electric cars someday, and I'm sure that we will, but we don't need all of the electric energy generation capacity to do that. We've got a lot of energy that we produce from industrial wind and also from large-scale solar. Uh, but right now, it's not renewable energy. Uh, one of the reasons that some of our energy cost is, in fact, in theory, a little bit lower than elsewhere in New England is because we've sold off these uh, uh, renewable energy credits, these pollution permits to other states, which theoretically has lowered our cost, but it has prohibited us from the practice that we engaged in the past of double dipping, of claiming that we have created all this renewable energy and then we've sold the wrecks and we're, we're, we're keeping basically, and I say this as a fraud examiner, there's something wrong with keeping two sets of books. Well, we got caught at that by Connecticut and we had to stop doing it. Now at least we have to be honest in our accounting about what in fact we're doing. The net effect of it, though, is even our own experts in the Public Service Department, as they look at industrial wind, saying it has absolutely no impact on global warming because, again, we are so small. Now, I realize that all of us want to do things that make us feel good. And making us feel good, I think, is important. But at the same time, if we make people feel good at the expense of our friends and our neighbors, of other Vermonters, who are dr drastically and dramatically harmed, we can say that, well, we're creating jobs when we do this. I've heard that argument over and over again. I remember when there was a point at which we were second in the nation in terms of our green energy jobs when the Bureau of Labor Statistics actually measured it. Do you know who was first? The District of Columbia, because green energy jobs included lobbyists, it included people who worked in the Department of Energy, and it included lawyers, because those were green energy jobs associated with that. I've been to the renewable, the renewable energy, the mountaintop wind sites uh, around such as Lowell and Sheffield and so on when they're under construction. And if you think those are Vermont jobs, all you have to do is drive into the parking lot and look at the license plates on the cars in those parking lots. That's a concern. Yes, I want to see green energy jobs. And yes, I believe in climate change. And I believe in the need to do things to combat it. But I want to do things that actually help real Vermonters. And those are things like promoting weatherization, promoting conservation, and doing things that make sense. Wind top rich line turbines, in my judgment, do not, for a variety of other reasons, including the absolute absence of storage and the fact that they don't produce as much power as it's claimed. I want to talk about character. Uh, Mr. Brock, you've raised questions about your opponent's character in this race. What, what is the issue that you feel people should know about? Well, I think uh, that unfortunately there are a number of issues. Um, David has had to apologize uh, several times during the course of the campaign. Uh, he apologized just the other day for uh, some comments that he made that were televised, and I just saw them for the first time, I think, yesterday or the day before, in which he made comments about the Vermont Air National Guard indicating that they absolutely did nothing effective uh, on 9-11. They simply got up and flew down over uh, the bombed out site that had already been bombed and they, they added no value to national security in the process. When in fact, uh, the fact was that these folks were the first to arrive on site uh, at uh, a time of extreme uh, concern in which no one knew what was happening and they patrolled the skies indeed under orders from the president to possibly even shoot down another airliner that might be threatening uh, uh, to fly into buildings in New York City, that they patrolled uh, uh, the entire East Coast and the Eastern Seaboard from uh, the bases here in Burlington, Vermont, for a period of time. For David to have made the remarks that he did about the National Guard, I think were not just unfortunate, but they represented a, a lack of knowledge for someone who could be a heartbeat away from being uh, the Commander-in-Chief of the Air National Guard. Uh, I, I think it was a really distressful a comment, and I think it was a comment that represented both ignorance and immaturity. That being said, that was not the only apology that he's had to make. Uh, when we had a debate in Tunbridge, for example, 
uh, when asked about how, uh, and I believe uh, he was asked by, by Mike Smith, how uh, he would uh, be able to financially compare based on, on my financial background. And he mentioned, among other things, that one of the reasons that he would be financially able uh, to do so was because he had a Jewish father. I think that was a very inappropriate remark, even if it were meant in jest. He subsequently apologized for it. Uh, when we had a debate uh, in which we were talking about uh, uh, marijuana, he made the remark that uh, he referred to the illicit marijuana market. He said he could refer to it as a black market for obvious reasons. Well, I found that to be a thoroughly assault insulting and offensive comment. Uh, we had other issues in which a campaign aide of his uh, retreated a number of extremely vicious and untrue racially oriented comments, uh, including one that accused me of tacitly supporting hate and possibly using racism only when it benefited with me. me. He said that that was a person who did so on her own, uh, not as part of the campaign, but she's a campaign aide that accompanies him to virtually every event, and she's here tonight at this event. Great. Let me have Mr. Zuckerman respond. I could go on. There, there are more. Well, I appreciate uh, my opponent's <laughs> thoughts and concerns, although, frankly, uh, these issues that he's raised have often been taking one straw out of a full hay pile and twisting it in ways that really take a, a contortionist to uh, understand. Uh, the only one I would say that has some validity, and I have been very clear yesterday in apologizing for it, is the issue around the F-35s. And I was discussing my concern about the F-35s, uh, noise issues actually, interestingly enough, for residents in Winooski and, and South Burlington and Burlington. And uh, I spoke poorly, uh, and I've apologized for that, and I'll apologize again. Our servicemen and women uh, put themselves in the line of fire uh, at a moment's notice, and I have the utmost respect for them, and I did not express that uh, well at all, and I will own that. Uh, that also is a sign of maturity. Uh, twisting people's words is actually something quite different than that. Uh, so I will own that, and, uh, and I apologize. Uh, the other ones have really been taken quite out of context. Uh, I was not joking about uh, my father's heritage, nor my mother's heritage, which I happen to have also referenced, uh, but I was raised in a frugal and efficient household, regardless of what uh, the religion was or the background was. And I was referencing that because as a farmer, I know what it's like every day to make ends meet in difficult uh, circumstances in low margin business. And I was referencing that I also grew up in a frugal household. Uh, I was fortunate, my dad was a doctor, and yet we were still very frugal, and I mentioned that. Uh, with respect to the illicit market and the underground market, I've actually talked about that for about a decade now, in terms of the language that we use, and the language that we use matters. And we have called the underground market the black market, when we reference drugs, for decades as a culture, as a society. And when I say I think we should not use the term black market, that's because I think it's critically important that we look at these words, because words matter. And we have a disproportionate ratio of people of color who are incarcerated. We have implicit bias in our policing and in ourselves. And when we use language like black market for drug dealers, we are associating the drug market with people of color. When actually in Vermont and around the country, there are many times more white people involved in the, in the drug market. And so I think it's critically important that we move our language away from biasing ourselves and our culture and our law enforcement to where we now prosecute people of color at a 12.5 to 1 ratio, the second highest in the country uh, here in Vermont. And I think it's critically important that we have discussions around okay. race let and me, profiling. Let me you Thank you. Give you another minute on this. It was an editorial uh, after uh, some of my comments about uh, uh, David's uh, racial event uh, in which he had a uh, party with uh, uh, music and laughter and a good time and a cash bar uh, to talk about racism in Burlington. And I was very concerned and frankly very offended that that was not uh, an appropriate thing to do to hold what was essentially a campaign event uh, using racism as a feature, uh, uh, particularly one that was paid for by him, organized by him, booked by him, 
uh, and all of the literature associated with it included prominent pictures of him and his campaign sign, and it was an event that campaign literature, lawn signs, and so on were distributed. I thought that was a, a, a grossly inappropriate event and venue to talk about so serious and so important a subject. And what the St. Albans uh, Messenger editorial commented was that David appears to be the person who sees a crowd and then rushes to the front of it to take advantage of it. And that's what I think he's doing. I think it was inappropriate then. I think the actions associated with it subsequently were inappropriate. And I see this as part of a pattern, a pattern of concern that really goes to the issue of uh, character judgment and to ask ourselves, is this the kind of person that we want to see a heartbeat away from being our governor? And I don't think it is. If I might. That's mine. Thanks. Well, I, I do find it interesting that St. Albans Messenger has actually done a couple of pieces without ever calling me to understand my perspective or side. They've pretty much just uh, reiterated uh, my opponent's position. So uh, I'd certainly always be happy to talk with anybody about these issues before they make uh, blanket statements that are factually inaccurate. It's interesting that, I've, that, it's, that I'm stated to be running to the front of the crowd. You know, when I started talking about genetic engineering labeling and issues around genetic engineering in 1999, I don't think there was a big crowd that I was getting in front of. I was bringing up an issue that was important to farmers and many consumers and continued to work on that for 15 years. When I brought up medical cannabis reform and the issue of actually changing to a recreational regulated system, uh, I think I've actually, as a politician, been well ahead of the curve of uh, most other politicians with respect to talking about what's actually going on on the ground, out in the public, uh, not waiting for the uh, momentum to build and then jumping on a bandwagon. You know, the issue of the event that was held in Burlington was an issue where I met with some folks in uh, early July. Uh, they expressed the need to be heard. And I said, whether or not I win the primary in August, as a senator, I think this is a discussion we have to have. We need to have a forum where people of color can just simply state their experiences that they've had with our law enforcement, in jobs, in housing, wherever they want. And the folks I was meeting with were saying the same thing to me, and I said, organize it the way that you want to have it. I will help make this happen, but it's really about you. How do you want it to happen? And they said, let's do this, we'll invite people, we'll make it both fun and serious. And they laid out how to do it. And the folks involved had about an hour where they spoke to elected leaders, including the state's attorney in Chittenden County, many elected legislators, and we listened people's experience, which is frankly a very important thing to do as elected leaders who are making policy. And I stand behind what I did and will continue to do so because people of color are facing serious consequences right. here let in me, Vermont. Let me interrupt. And we need to address this. Pot legislation, what would you recommend be done next year? Well, I introduced a bill a few years ago, S95, that would allow for uh, home growth. It would allow for cultivating licenses uh, to allow those who are currently in the underground market to become legitimate legal and, uh, and business people as they are now, but not paying their fair share of taxes. And it would limit the number of retail establishments so that people who are afraid of them popping up all over would, would be in a limited number uh, so that it wouldn't sort of take over in sort of the boogeyman way that people are afraid of. When you look at Colorado, they haven't taken over. The sky hasn't fallen. Uh, drug use amongst teenagers, amongst both uh, cannabis and heroin is slightly down. I don't attribute that to it being a legal system, but clearly the sky has not fallen the way that opponents fear it would. And I would take the revenues from that, uh, and we will debate our difference of opinion, I'm sure, on what those revenues would be. Uh, my opponent compares apples to oranges. I prefer apples to apples when I talk about numbers. Uh, but the tax dollars, not the sales, gross sales numbers, uh, would be used first for implementing the law, for prevention and treatment, particularly for our opiate addicts, who we need to help get off of their addiction and become productive members of society again because that is ripping our communities apart and damaging our economy, and money towards um, employment law and law enforcement for drug recognition officers. Then money would also be used for higher education trust fund. Invest in an endowment so that we don't squander the money or create long-term programs because we will probably have a bubble of income that will go away when all the rest of the states do this because this is going to happen all across the country. We have votes in November in Massachusetts and Maine. They're now going to beat us to it uh, when we would have been earlier in the line had we done it last year. Before I give Mr. Brock an opportunity to answer this question, why would you want to start implementing programs that in a few years you wouldn't be able to presumably pay for? 
Well, that's what I was saying is that the, the initial money, which we would continue, there will be revenues just as there is from beer today. We still make money on beer. Right, so, so you're saying so it the, diminish. Right, so, the, so the, the bubble would go away, but there would still be income. So that's why I want to be judicious with our dollars. The ongoing expenses of prevention and treatment uh, and implementing our law uh, will be funds that will continue to come perpetually. Uh, the bubble of money is what would go to the higher ed trust fund. And if there was a larger bubble, we could put it towards an economic development capital fund. Okay. Again, for long-term investment, but not long-term obligation. Okay. Right. right. Again, uh, the arithmetic simply doesn't work. It doesn't work because even if you take the most optimistic estimates, such as in the RAND report uh, that was done, that RAND report basically says if marijuana is, quote, taxed aggressively, if we suppress our black market, and this is important, if increase, if consumption increased by 25 to 100 percent, tax revenues from Vermont could be in the range of 20 million to 75. Now that's with a significant increase in what is now one of the highest marijuana consumption rates in the nation. Not as high though as Colorado, who has surpassed us for being first in the nation among youth use of marijuana. It indicates that we could supply large numbers of out-of-state users, and then there's a caveat. Unless and until other states in the Northeast also legalize marijuana, that flow could then reverse if those states impose lower taxes, undermining revenues from taxing Vermont's own revenue. They added also that the cross-border commerce, commerce might likely engender a federal government response, making all projections highly uncertain. Now, if we look at actual facts rather than theory, the fact is Colorado. Colorado has a 27.5% tax rate between fees, excise taxes, and sales taxes. Vermont proposed a 25% tax. If we apply the 25% tax to the, if we look at just the actual revenues that Colorado has gotten compared to its total state budget, and we apply that to Vermont's total state budget, guess what we come up with? $20 million. That's what we come up with, but there's a caveat again. That $20 million that, Col that we would have gotten using Colorado's method, Colorado, 24% of its marijuana net revenues come from edibles, and we're not including edibles. They also have a much wider distribution network uh, of marijuana outlets than we would have under the legislation in Vermont, which makes it even less. David's comment is that we're going to use this marijuana revenue in order to deal with our opiate addiction pro problem. And that, to me, strikes me like taking a raging fire and saying we're going to put it out by pouring gasoline on it. Again, I think it makes no sense. And the notion that there's going to be revenue over and above that, after we deal with the cost of startup, after we deal with the cost of the software associated with a new tax regimen, and after we also look at what's happening in surrounding states. The Massachusetts tax rate that's been proposed for the ballot right now is just 12% one half of the tax rate that we would employ. The arithmetic doesn't work. Let's talk about the opiate problem. The, the, the problem people say hasn't even peaked. Mm -hmm. Pouring a ton of money at it, what more, what difference should we do? Well, we've discussed this before. Obviously, this isn't our, our first uh, debate. Uh, I think David's position, and again, you, you get a chance to, to, to speak to it, is that we know how to deal with the opiate crisis. We are simply underfunding what we deal with, and that large uh, amounts of inpatient treatment are necessary, that we don't have the money, nor have we uh, created the will in order to do it. Uh, I think that may or may not be the case, because in my experience in talking with uh, professionals in the field, I'm not sure that we are consistently applying any particular methodology, one, and two, we don't have a consistent measure to tell us that what we're do whether what we're doing is or is not working. I think we need to have that in place so that when we do expend the large amount of money, and no question, it will take a large amount of money to deal with this problem, that we do so in an informed way so that we're spending money where we know we're going to get a result, so that we look at whether or not the recovery rates are actually, in fact, working over time. It's clear to me that we are going to have to invest more money. Uh, and the question, of course, always becomes, when we talk about invest, because often to the other side, invest means spend, and to me, it means invest. It means making hard decisions about where we place our money. 
uh, whether or not we are able to look for revenue sources that will help us invest in this by lowering expenses that we have elsewhere in government. I believe there are tremendous opportunities that we have right now to lower cost of government. Uh, to look for errors, and we'll talk about that uh, separately, but I do believe that there are revenue sources that we can have that can help us along. But I think the thing that can help us as much as anything else is doing things that make sense, doing things that work, and also looking at what other people are doing in other states that work and finding the most cost-effective solutions. My sense is so often we apply a, pro a program that we apply a methodology without any real clear understanding as to whether or not it is being successful, whether it will be successful, and okay. measuring if it has been successful. Before Mr. Zuckerman answers, what do you mean by revenue sources? What are you talking about with that? I'm talking about revenue sources uh, from, from a number of areas. Among them are uh, doing things like uh, re-engineering uh, parts of state government that I believe are very inefficient right now in which I believe that we can save a considerable amount of money. I believe revenue sources includes looking for errors. Uh, we need to declare a war on error in state government because we do, I believe, leave significant amounts of money on the table through inefficiency. I mean, in looking at things like the Agency of Human Services and the silos in that that do create some of the situations that David is referring to in our educational establishment in which we are providing duplicative services by duplicative people. Right. Thank you. Well, I appreciate that 15 minutes ago, my idea was somehow going to cost more, and now it's going to save money. I'm not really sure which side of that equation my opponent is on, but uh, it sounded like it to me, uh, and I appreciate that you feel it would save money, because I do think it would actually increase uh, outcomes and, uh, and save money. Um, I do want to address uh, the opiate issue, which is, I think, what your question was. And, uh, you know, there are both inpatient and outpatient programs that work, and they work well, and I trust our medical professionals. And I also trust our state government employees who are working very hard every day to do quality work for our citizens of our state. So when we talk about huge waste or huge errors, you're pointing the fingers at our Vermont state workers, and I don't think that's appropriate. There are places in the administration that I think we can save money. Uh, you know, clearly Health Connect has been a boondoggle. We did not administer that well. But in the grand scheme of things, numerous auditors, yourself included, have found some savings, but they add up to a couple million here and a couple million there, which is very real money but it's not the money you need for the energy efficiency that you talked about earlier. It doesn't provide the money for the opiate treatment that we need. It doesn't provide the money for higher education funding. And so I regularly hear my opponent talk about these things we need to do, and we're gonna save it through nebulous efficiencies because we're gonna run government like a business, but he's never actually very specific about what those are. And typically what that means, and we've seen it in prior Republican administrations, is cut services to working people, which is essentially a poor tax. So we're either gonna increase costs we're working for, or we're going to address revenues in a fair, progressive manner. And you're going to have that difference between us, and that's up to voters to decide which way and which lens you want us to look at that from. In order to treat opiate uh, challenges, we do need money. We have underfunded that, and as Attorney General candidate um, T.J. Donovan has talked about, it is criminal. There is no waiting list in medicine like there is for our opiate addicts. And we have had people die because they haven't had treatment, we have had people sadly commit crimes because they are addicted and they are trying to feed that habit and they have to steal to do it. And it is not productive for our society in either of those scenarios to underfund treatment and access to treatment. Which is why, you know, as we disagree on cannabis reform, there is no doubt that there are consequences from people using cannabis. I, no one's ever said that it's a perfect drug and there's no problems with it. But it is currently a huge underground economy my discussion is simply bringing it above ground, regulating it so that there's cleaner product, and having those folks pay their fair share of taxes just like the rest of us so that we would have money for our opiate treatment and education and prevention for our youth. I think that's actually very fitting. Let me start this round with you. Why is the opiate crisis as bad as it is? Why are so many people using these drugs? Who do you blame? Well, clearly uh, there's a few different reasons. One is economic injustice in our society. When people can't pay their bills and they can't stay in stable homes and they have to keep moving, when people are sort of destitute and not very happy in life because they're not going to the dignity of a well enough paying job to pay their basic ways, people get into any number of drugs. Nobody starts out as an opiate addict thinking, oh, I'm just gonna try opium and, and not become an addict. You know, it is often because people are in very tough times and circumstances 
The other place where it really comes from is pharmaceutical drugs. We, on the national level, started allowing pharmaceutical drug marketing, which I think is a terrible thing for our country. Obviously, that's not something we can deal with at the state level as well as they can nationally. Uh, we have drug companies that now, it is proven new that the opiate painkillers would be addictive and problematic, and I really encourage uh, our next Attorney General, T.J. Donovan, to go after those pharmaceutical companies and make them pay for the cost of their uh, opiates that they handed out like candy. Uh, that thankfully our administration of the last six years started tackling long before others, and he got ridiculed for it. Well, in Vermont, we face our challenges and we work to solve our challenges. And folks are, you know, I know someone who became an opiate addict because of painkillers, a very productive young man, and his life is ruined right now, and he had to go to Florida for treatment. You know, this is the biggest uh, social and economic injustice problem out there, but it actually is facing people of all economic stripes which is why I think all of us in this room, regardless of right, left, wealthy, poor, we all recognize what a huge problem it is, and we have to come up with the money to pay for it, to help people get off of these dangers. Mr. Brock. The best solution to many of the problems that Vermont faces, and uh, certainly a solution to an extent of the opiate problem, is a better economy. Uh, our focus on creating an economy that works and creating jobs and opportunity for our people is the best solution to any poverty program that we have. We've talked about, for example, what are some of the specific things that we can do to make that happen? And I mentioned uh, this war on error and this war on mistakes. And I'll give you the concrete examples that David says I haven't given. If we take a look at things like Vermont Health Connect, in which we uh, paid a million dollars of legal expenses to find out what went wrong when CGI, our first contractor, failed, and then we failed to collect virtually a penny of damages based on all the things that they failed to do during that contract. We have a second contract now with Optum, uh, again, a contract that's in the tens and close to $100 million, in which they failed to perform, and we failed to collect any money back. We give 41% of our contracts out on a no-bid basis, and how do we expect that we are getting an efficient government as a result? Those are some of the kinds of things that I'm talking about, about waste and incompetence, and what can you do about it? Well, one of the things I did at State Auditor, for example, was take a look at just Medicaid prescription drugs, one of a long series of audits that I have designed and thought through. We found that we had errors, hundreds, thousands of errors in prescriptions being given out over a two-year period, and I found $2 million worth of wasted mistakes, worth wasted errors of prescriptions in which people were prescribed things like fatal doses of drug combinations month after month, or people were able to get five or six prescriptions uh, of a 30-day supply of drugs within the same 30-day period, and we could go on and on. These kinds of issues exist throughout state government. They're not necessarily a reflection on the competence of individual state employees, but they are a reflection on a system that doesn't work nearly as well as it should and should be subject to a great deal more probity than we have right now. And if we did that, I know based on what I've seen that we could do better. I know also based on what I've done in the private sector in similar situations of re-engineering multi-million dollar operations that there are the ability to go in and make the kinds of changes, particularly in a system that's structured the way it is. And I've had the experience of looking at most of those systems close in as your state auditor. Thank you for your answer. It's now time uh, for our closing uh, statements, the fastest hour of your day. Uh, we begin with Senator Zuckerman. Well, thank you, Mark, uh, Ann, and Vermont Digger for hosting this event. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all. It's our third debate in three days, so we're having fun with this. Uh, you know, I'm a small business owner. I run a farm. I know what it's like to do human resources, market my products, uh, find employees, pick up the bees at the end of the day when everything wasn't quite finished on time. I know what small business owners face in Vermont. Running a farm, obviously, it's a marginal business. I know how to find efficiencies in my business. And I think it's important, as my opponent talked about, to find efficiencies in government. But I also think it's important to recognize that government is not a business. It is not a targeted scenario where I just have to meet these people's needs. Government has to actually fill the gaps wherever there are gaps, regardless of the different circumstances. But as a small business owner, I know how to find those efficiencies. I work in our rural environment. I want to preserve and expand the jobs in our rural areas. I know what that takes. 
I want to leave Vermont better, just as I do with my own soil that I'm farming right now. I want to leave it healthier for future generations, including my daughter, who's in our elementary schools. And I understand the challenges in our school system through her eyes and ours as parents. I've got the endorsement of Senator Leahy, Senator Sanders, and Congressman Peter Welsh. I'm pleased to have our entire federal delegation's endorsement. I look forward to earning your endorsement and your vote anytime. Now you can vote tomorrow all the way through November 8th. There's only two weeks left. And I would urge you to visit my website, ZuckermanForVermont.com, to learn more information about the various issues we've discussed today, facts that matter, and uh, I appreciate your support. Thank you. In my time as a state senator and as a state auditor, uh, I've come to understand deeply how government works in Vermont and also at times how it doesn't work. I know that government exists to provide services to the people uh, who live in our state, to provide a safety net for those who need it most, and to provide an environment that fosters uh, growth and development of business and industry, the kind of growth necessary to provide the jobs that will keep uh, our citizens employed. I know that we've got a great deal of work to do. We've had six years of economic stagnation. Uh, we've had a uh, delay. We've had uh, uncertainty created by government policies that uh, seem to uh, take us in directions that no one has gone before. We, have a, uh, we suffer from a first in the nation mentality. And I'm happy to be first in the nation in preventing slavery, but I'm not happy to be first in the nation to make Vermont a guinea pig uh, through which uh, a variety of social ideas are, are pushed that cause our, our, our state to stagnate economically and increase the cost and burden on every taxpayer. I believe that we do have a bright future. I believe the glass is half full and not half empty. And that's why we live here. We have a pristine environment. We have a low crime rate. Uh, we have a people who knows how to work and knows how to work hard. And what we need is a government that's beside them and not necessarily on their back the way uh, we've been faced with in the past six years. We've added taxes uh, and spending, increased spending at the rate of $700 million. We've increased uh, our spending at the rate of 5% per year on an economy that's growing at 2% per year. We have to rein in our spending and we have to prioritize what we do so that we do the things that are really important, so that we do the things that provide that safety net for the people who really need it, but at the same time, live within our means. And we haven't been living within our means, and that's one of the problems that's created the issue with so many Vermonters who feel that they can't afford to live in Vermont. We have to make Vermont livable. We have to reduce costs. We have to make Vermont a place in which people can say, I really can retire here, as opposed to I have to pack up and leave because it's become too expensive a place to live. That's what my focus on as Lieutenant Governor. I'm a person who believes in keeping an open mind and an open door. I know that as a lieutenant governor, you can only influence things. You can't make people do things. And there is that old phrase that Vermonters will do almost anything you ask them to do and almost nothing you tell them to do. I want to keep that in mind. Throughout my career, I've had a variety of jobs. I've been a soldier. I've been a policeman. Uh, I've been a polygraph examiner, which, of course, is useful when, when dealing with the legislature. I've been a small <laughs> business owner. Uh, and I've been an officer of one of the largest uh, financial services companies in America. And I've been a state senator and a state auditor. That's a wide range of experience and a wide range of perspectives to bring to bear on the issues that we face. It's a job that I would love to do, that I want to do, and I want to do it for my friends and neighbors. If you want to know more, please look at www.randybrock.com. There's a lot more information out there, and I ask earnestly for your support and for your vote on November the 8th. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for joining us tonight for the Lieutenant Governor's debate. Let's thank our candidates for being here. A few words from Ann Galloway, and then uh, we hope you can join us. Thank you all for coming tonight. Just a reminder, we have the cash bar if you want to linger and, and uh, chat some more. And thank you again for coming. Good night.